I'm pretty sure it's the biggest one I've ever cooked and we're gonna smoke it today right here in the Weber Summit Charcoal Grill. I put it down because it's kind of heavy. I know a lot of you are interested in learning more about the summit and that's how you found my video. So I thought I would start out out here so I could show you how I have the grill set up for this brisket cook and it also it also gave me a chance to show you some of the features about the grill that I like and don't like for that matter. One of the things I really like about this grill is the charcoal grate. It's adjustable and it goes up and down, which I'll get to in a second, but it's also just extremely well built. The tines on the grates are extremely thick and there's some huge advantages to that. First off, it, it just should last longer than a normal kettle grate, but also the bars are closer together, which means there's less of a chance of charcoal falling through before it's burned up. In some of my other grills, I used to do a crisscross pattern with my charcoal grates to prevent the little bits of unburnt charcoal from falling through, but I, I don't think that's gonna be necessary with this particular grate, which is nice. I like the style of fire grate because it allows for more airflow around the charcoal. Um, typically, Kamados usually have a cast iron plate with holes drilled into it. And the problem is on long cooks, especially my medium big grenade was really bad about this. On long cooks, those holes would fill up with ash and sometimes it would put the fire out completely. So this is, this is nice because not only does it prevent that from being a problem, but it will also heat up faster. So when you're starting it up, it heats up faster because there's plenty of air movement around it, which is really nice. What's also nice about it is with a setup like this, you can, you can burn either briquettes or lump charcoal, which is great because I know some people have, actually a lot of people have preferences one way or the other. I'm curious, if you have a preference between lump or, or Kingsford, if you could leave a comment and let me know and then let me know what kind of cooker you are using because I'm pretty sure that there's going to be a correlation between the type of cooker you use and, and the type of fuel you prefer. And I, I'm just curious to see how that plays out. So if you have a preference, just leave it in the comments and uh, that would be great. So as I mentioned earlier, the charcoal grate will go up or down, which is great because it's almost like having two grills in one or at least, or at least two like modes of cooking in one. When the charcoal grate is in the higher position, it's in kettle mode and it basically cooks and feels almost exactly like an oversized kettle, which is great for two zone cooking where you want a hot side for searing and a, and a cold side for indirect. But also if you put the charcoal grate in the lower position, it's got all the versatility of a Kamado. So you can, you can cook raised direct if you want for things like dark meat chicken or whole chickens, or you can put in the heat deflector for indirect cooking like smoking or roasting or high heat pizza cooks. It's, it's really great and I love all that extra versatility and it's nice to be able to have the best of both worlds. Now one of the things that I wish Weber would have done differently is included a tool for adjusting that charcoal grate that didn't require you to get your hands dirty. Um, just something as simple as this, uh, grill gripper tools work fine and they're not that expensive. I feel like they could have thrown that in. The other thing, it's not just the charcoal grate, it's also the main grate. The main grate itself has handles, but the center grate doesn't. And the center grate has to come off if you're gonna hang this on the hooks on the side. If you don't remove the center grate before you hang that grate, the center grate's just gonna fall out and it could possibly break. By the way, I love these hooks here. They're great, no pun intended. There should be a fire tool of some sort. The cooking grate and heat deflectors are hinged so you can theoretically add and manipulate coals, but there's no way to actually do that without burning your fingerprints off. <laughs> I'd really like to see Weber include this with future releases of this grill. These days, most Kamados come with these types of tools because they're necessary for using the grill properly. It's pretty much an industry standard and I'd like to see Weber lead out in this area instead of forcing customers to pay an add-on price or go to their competitors for stuff like this. That being said, it's not that big a deal to me. I've already got these tools from some of the other Kamados I bought in the past. I'm just not sure what somebody else would do if they were in this situation. Now that out of the way, here's how I ever... Now that out of the way, here's how I ever... Now with that out of the way, here's everything... Now, with that out of the way, here's how I have everything set up for the cook tomorrow. Mm -hmm. 
First off, I have the charcoal grate in the low position. I filled up the cooking chamber with charcoal all the way up to the top, pretty much. Instead of using the Summit's built-in charcoal starter to start the grill, I decided instead I'm gonna use the Minion method. If you're not familiar with the Minion method, it's where you leave a spot in the center of your charcoal pile where you can put 10 to 15 lit briquettes. And this allows you to control the fire and bring it up to temperature slowly. I like those coals using a chimney starter. Now, if you don't have one of these, I'll put a link to these in the comment section, but you can get these at any Lowe's or Home Depot anywhere. They're real easy to find. So here's a tip. Most people like to put their coal in the top and then use uh, newspaper. It's what it's designed for. You just stuff two pieces of newspaper underneath here and then light them. And once you light the newspaper, it lights the coals and that works really, really well. But what I like to do is I like to use the side burner on my gasser. The reason this works so well is because the side burner burns in a circular pattern that matches up with the bottom, the circular shape of the bottom of the chimney. So the coals light super duper fast and there's no leftover ash from the burnt newspaper to deal with. After that, all you have to do is pour the coals into the hole you created in your charcoal and then stack your wood chunks around it. Now the other great way to light your coals is just to take a big bottle of lighter fluid, the biggest one you can find, and dump all of it into the grill, making sure to get as much of it as you can, not only on the coals, but also on the sides of the grill. Then all you have to do is light a match and walk away. I was just kidding. Don't do that. Once the coals are lit and burning, just put the heat deflector over the top. This thing is awesome, by the way. It's, it's actually two pieces of metal with an air gap in between. That's not really completely clear when you look at pictures. And the best thing about it is it's not fragile. So for someone like me who eventually drops everything, that's perfect. Best of all, it comes with its own storage spot, which is super convenient. After that, you put the drip pans in place. I don't think I'm gonna use water on this cook. Uh, I wanna see how it does without it, but that's certainly something you could do. One thing worth noting is at first, it appears that the normal nine by 13 drip pans that you can get anywhere don't fit, um, which is unfortunate because the smaller Weber drip pans are actually a lot more expensive. But it turns out if you actually work with them and kind of massage them into place, they not only fit, but they provide a lot better coverage and a lot better protection from hot, hot spots anyways. So after everything is up and running, I'll set the lower vent into smoke setting, which is this circle right here. It's not this weird diagram of, what is that, snakes spooning or something? I don't know. Once you have the lower vent into smoke mode, that allows a very consistent low level of air to flow through the cooker. When you cook with a kettle, it's harder to get a precise low level of airflow. So this is a really nice addition. The top vent, which is really freaking cool by the way, I'll set at one third to one half of the way open. And when it comes up to about 50 degrees below my target temp, I'll back it off to about one fourth of the way open. And then depending on how the summit behaves, I'll make adjustments from there. Now let's go look at that gigantic brisket, shall we? Under normal circumstances, a good rule of thumb is try to trim back to a quarter of inch of fat all the way along the bottom of the fat cap. But today, since I'm just cooking this for family, it doesn't really matter. So I'm just gonna do it easy and get, get most of the big stuff off and, and not worry about it. For a binder, I'm gonna use olive oil. I know a lot of people like to use mustard and that works fine, but olive oil works really well too. And to me, it's just less messy and it's easier to work with. The rub I'm using today was provided to me by Matt Pittman at Meat Church Rubs. Thank you, Matt. So the rub I'm using today is called Holy Cow. <laughs> and it's really good. It's got a great flavor. Um, a lot of pepper, a lot of garlic. 
um, spice, a little bit of a kick to it. Uh, it's, a, it's a really, it's a very Texas flavor. It's a very Texas barbecue brisket flavor. So, and I like it because every time I use it, I get a really good smoke ring on my meat. So um, I highly recommend this, check this out. I'll put a link in the comment section to their website. They have, <laughs> they have some really funny names for their, for their different rubs. One that they just came out with that I'm interested in is their bacon rub. They came out with a rub that tastes like bacon. These are good people, y'all support them. We need to support companies like this. So give me just a second to get this prepped up and I'll be right back. Ah, that was easy. Okay, so I'll put this in the fridge overnight and tomorrow when I wake up, we'll smoke a brisket. Time to make the donuts. Hey guys, I just wanted to give you an update on the cook. Everything is going great. We're about four hours into the cook right now, and the grill is behaving perfectly. I mean, for the first three hours, it was pretty much locked in right around 225, and then about an hour ago, uh, I had to, uh, I increased the temp. I like to cook low and slow at the beginning of a brisket cook, and then hot and fast at the end, because I feel like it gives me the best of both worlds. Um, and so I opened the vent a little bit and it jumped up to right at 280, 280, 285, which is perfect. That's exactly what I'm looking for. I was a little nervous because it's kind of windy out today, um, about 15 mile an hour winds. And so, and I've never done a, a long, low and slow cook with this, uh, with this particular cooker, but it's done great. I'm really happy with it. I've noticed there is a smoke leak right here, right in the front. Um, I, I don't know what's, what the problem is. I'm sure it has something to do with the gasket but it hasn't affected the ability to control temps so right now i'm not that worried about it if it doesn't go if it doesn't go away in the next few cooks i'll probably call weber and see what they can do about it but anyways that's the update so far and uh, i'll keep you posted Well, I just took the brisket off. Uh, about seven and a half hours into the cook, it was probing at 195, and it was uh, it it probed just like butter. I stuck the I stuck this probe in, and uh, it went in just like butter, just like it's supposed to. So, right now it's sitting in the oven because I am uh, normally I would put it in a cooler, but I am between coolers right now. So it's gonna sit in the oven, and I'll let it rest for a couple hours and uh, I'll show you pictures, don't worry, I'm not gonna forget that, but everything went great. This guy did exactly what he was supposed to do. I was really happy with it. To be honest, this, this feels exactly like working with my uh, 
Big Green Egg XL and my Kamado Joe Big Joe. There's just there's not much difference. Um, so I I really I really liked it. I, I really like this grill. I, in fact, it it's I really like this grill. Um, and I, I didn't know I didn't know how I was gonna feel at the end of this cook because this was my first low and slow. Um, I was sure hoping it would be a good experience because you know I've already bought it. Um, but I, I'm really happy with how everything turned out. It it, it was great. It was great. Um, one more thing. One of my subscribers asked me what audio equipment I use. I right now and in most of my videos I have. Um, it's called a Tackstar microphone. It's a very inexpensive mic. Um, it is hooked up to the shoe mount on my on my DSLR. It works it works really really well with Canon DSLR, um, and it's on a it's on a uh, 11 inch articulating arm. I'll probably cut a picture of it in here so you'll be able to see it. Uh, super super cheap. Um, I, I bought it for 30 bucks and I just looked and it's actually 25 dollars. And when I originally bought it, I was uh, I, I didn't know if I wanted to spend a lot of money on this YouTube thing because I didn't know I didn't know where it was going to go. So I I got this. I saw some good reviews on it, so I got it. And and I thought, well, I'll just replace it replace it later if I if I need to. But I'm really happy with it. Like really happy with it. Um, I think actually most people would be um, as long as you use it for what a for what a shotgun mic is supposed to be used for, um, which, which is when you're right in front of the camera. Because they can't, you can't zoom in with sound like you can with a lens. All it does is block out everything else. So there's like a really loud bird right behind the camera, which you can probably hear a little bit, but it's a lot louder to me right now. So, and just to give you an idea of how well it works, um, I'll, I'll just I'll just show you. So th this is what everything would sound like. This right here is what everything would sound. Oh, that's the that's the cord. This is what everything would sound like if if I didn't have. Um, this microphone turned on so you can tell it's a it's a pretty substantial difference so for 25 bucks you know take a look at it but if you're gonna be further away from the camera you need to get a lapel mic um, which I used for I I used one called the road link in this video so the first part of this video up until today all that was done with uh, all that was done with the road link. I just realized you probably can't hear me very well is that better? Yeah. So the first part of this video, I used the uh, the Rode Link, um, and I have another lapel mic that I've used in a few other videos. But I think for most people, especially starting out, if you want a good cheap microphone, this is this is a good one. So I hope that helps. Um, I'm gonna go inside and enjoy some brisket, and I really appreciate you guys watching, and we'll see you in the next one. Not bad. Awesome. What do you think? Heck. Okay.